I'm Alec Abdekar, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. A lot of interesting developments are going on behind the scenes over this past week. I have recently been in touch with another fantastic history podcaster named Emmanuel Dubois on the podcast called Lafayette, We Are Here. So go listen to his stuff, it's really good. That's all I should probably say so as to not give away too much. Beyond that, I have recently been ranked in the top 100 in history podcasts at Good Pods. The things are quite going actually well right now in my podcasting career, and I'm currently taking a summer class as of now, although I should be able to keep a weekly schedule. But obviously, my studies have the main priority. Last week, we discussed how Frederick nearly botched up the battle against an Austrian force in Moravia. The Battle of Kotzitz was an extremely crucial battle in the military career of Frederick the Great. In this battle, which took place on the morning of May 17th, 1742, victory was not certain. The Prussian army was exhausted, and the fighting was very confused at times. However, the steadiness and the discipline of the Prussian army, specifically the infantry, won the day for Frederick once again. Frederick needed peace between himself and Austria because the Prussian economy was not built to last a long war. War, after all, is one of, if not the most, expensive things a state can undertake. Despite the vast riches of Silesia and the plunder he gained from campaigning in Moravia, the Prussian state was running out of money to continue the war. Frederick hoped that the Queen of Hungary would be able to come to peace with him with the British ambassador as mediator between the two sides. After all, Britain had no interest in whatsoever in who owed... What's the land again? Silesia? Anyway, who cares? The British just wanted to weaken the power of France. The peace agreement would be agreeable to the British as well because the separate peace between Austria and Prussia might cause tension between the allies of Prussia and France. However, our focus today will not be on the diplomacy that could create peace between Prussia and Austria. Instead, it will be about a woman who Frederick called, quote, an ambitious and vindictive enemy, who was the more dangerous because she was a woman, headlong in her opinions, implacable, devoured by ambition. She was probably the greatest Habsburg monarch of all time. That's right, today we will be talking about Maria Theresa of Austria. I figured we need to give her a proper welcome to our story. After all, the quote goes, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Plus, my main source for today is an incredible book that not only discusses Maria Theresa, but her famous daughters in, as well, including Marie Antoinette. This book is called In the Shadow of the Empress, The Defiant Lives of Maria Theresa, Mother of Marie Antoinette, and Her Daughters by Nancy Goldstone. I'm not connected to her in any way, but I just gotta say that if you are interested in this time period, please check out this book. The writing style has a bit of humor in it, and the book is very easy to follow. Honestly, Ms. Goldstone, I know you're not listening, but I would absolutely love to have you on the show. Your writing rocks. Anyway, let's go all the way back to Charles II of Spain. You know, the extremely deformed guy because of inbreeding. And somehow he lived to 39. Anyway, before he died, the Pope convinced Charles to pass on the Kingdom of Spain to Louis XIV's grandson, because Charles had no heirs. However, the then Holy Roman Emperor, Leopold I, who had two sons named Joseph and Charles, objected to this, because Spain should be under Habsburg control. After all, Spain's empire in the Americas brought in like, I don't know, a bajillion dollars worth of gold and silver? This wealth was what made the Habsburgs wealthy in the first place. Therefore, Leopold sure as heck didn't want to lose Spain to France if he could help it. Therefore, Spain had two competing kings. There was Louis' grandson on one side and Leopold's son, uh, Charles, on the other. Keep in mind how young the two competing kings are. Louis XIV's grandson was 16 years old and Charles was 20 years old. 
I'm 21 years old, and I would never dream about running a country, let alone a colonial empire that stretched the globe. All right, now we're going to do a quick-fire review about the Pragmatic Sanction, but there's a full-on episode about it called The Habsburgs and the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713. Episode 14. Check it out, folks. Okay, here we go. So, in 1703, Charles signed a document that if both Charles and Joseph had died without a male heir, the line would go to Joseph's daughters. The idea was that Spain would go to Charles once the war was won and would have to worry about Spain and not the Holy Roman Empire. But instead, this happened. Leopold I died in 1705, thus making Joseph the emperor. Charles, however, was unpopular in Spain and could not go much farther into Spain than Barcelona. And in 1711, Joseph I died of smallpox at the age of just 32. This made Charles the Holy Roman Emperor. Therefore, if he died without a son, Joseph's daughters would inherit the Habsburg lands. Then comes a great line from Nancy Goldstone's book on Maria Theresa, when she writes, quote, But what to do about it? Charles had made a binding commitment to his father, the Emperor. And then, in a flash of inspiration, he realized that he was now emperor, and an emperor could decree whatever he wanted, even if it meant reversing the policies of a previous emperor. See what I mean? It's the snarky humor that I absolutely love and brings history alive. But at that point in time, Emperor Charles VI had no children whatsoever. However, three and a half years later, a beautiful blonde-haired baby was born a bit after 7 a.m. on May 13, 1717, in the magnificent Hofburg Palace. This is the part of the book that I just couldn't help but laugh at. According to Nancy Gold Goldstone's book on Maria Theresa and her daughters, she writes, Maria Theresa, quote, saw her parents regularly and adored them. Her governess was loving and kind and became almost a second mother to her. She goes on to say, quote, Consequently, she experienced as close to an idyllic childhood as it was possible to achieve at an imperial court. After reading about all the trauma and heartbreak of Frederick's childhood, I thought that it was just a sign of the times and that all fathers were cruel and life was really harsh back in the 1700s for everyone. And then I read this. All I can say is, wow. I was so wrong. Apparently, her education was also easy on her. There was no trauma of sleepless nights in a prison forced to listen to sermons that lasted hours that you didn't even respect, let alone believe in. Nope, Maria Theresa was to be educated as a, quote, ornament at the court, and had a e heavy emphasis on music and dancing. She also was skilled in speaking other languages. Maria Theresa was fluent in French, German, and Latin. She used Latin to speak to the Hungarians because, well, Hungarian is a bloody hard language to learn. So what happens when Maria Theresa turns six? Well, you have to pick out a suitable bachelor to marry by then, don't you? That's right. Charles VI was already thinking about marriage for Maria Theresa when she was just six years old. Normal stuff, I know. So... Who else but our old pal Prince Eugene of Savoy enters the stage and suggests that Maria Theresa should marry the oldest son of the Duke of Lorraine. See, the Duke of Lorraine was an old army pal and Prince Eugene thought that this marriage might protect Lorraine from being conquered by France. However, the oldest son died before he would take his trip to Vienna. However, the Duke of Lorraine had a second son named Francis Stephen of Lorraine. He was 14 when he reached the court in Vienna. Maria Theresa was in absolute awe of Francis's good looks and mild personality. This original awe would grow to become a mutual love as Francis and Maria Theresa would grow up with each other for the next 10 years. However, Charles was on the market trying to find a better match for Maria Theresa if she was going to inherit the Habsburg Empire. After all, they could do a lot better than the Duchy of Lorraine. Why not Spain? In May of 1725, the emperor agreed to a deal that would have turned 
European geopolitics on its head, if it actually worked. See, this dude from Spain, the Duke of Riperda, promised an alliance between Spain and Austria against their enemies, France and Britain. The deal was that if Austria sent 30,000 troops to help Spain take back Gibraltar, the Spanish would send Austria 3 million in gold per year to advance to finance that army. In exchange for recognizing the pragmatic sanction, Maria Theresa would marry the King of Spain's son. There was one small detail, however. See, the King of Spain expected to pay just 400,000 florins for the alliance itself, not 3 million per year. So, the dopey duke who negotiated with Charles VI was arrested in Spain. This whole endeavor almost led to a war with almost all the great powers of Europe, including Spain, turning against Austria. In order to keep the peace and try to have powers accept the pragmatic sanction, Charles gave away Austria's shipping rights, including giving up the Austin Company that set up a few holdings in India, to Britain. During this time, Maria Theresa was almost married to Frederick in order to, for the Prussians to accept the pragmatic sanction. Instead, Frederick was forced to marry Elizabeth Christina of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, partially because Maria Theresa was a Catholic rather than a Protestant. King Frederick Wilhelm I expected Austria to back his claims to the duchies of Jülich and Berg. This was a broken promise by the Austrians. By 1731, Maria Theresa was 14 years old and, was, and her first and only love was Francis of Lorraine. However, Charles still wanted a better marriage deal, a sentence that I did not expect to read so nonchalantly. Anyway. In order to test the feelings between Francis and Maria Theresa, Charles VI sent Francis on a European tour. Francis had a lovely time and even became friends with Frederick when he was engaged to a woman he despised in February of 1732. However, this test did not phase Maria Theresa in the slightest. The British ambassador wrote to Austria wrote, quote, she sighs and pines all night for her Duke of Lorraine. If she sleep, it is only to dream of him. If she wake, it is but to talk of him to her lady-in-waiting. Then, of course, the War of Polish Succession ended with the Saxon elector as the King of Poland accepting the pragmatic sanction in the process. Spain would receive Naples and the ports of Tuscany. France had the condition that the Duchy of Lorraine would pass to Stanislaus Leszczynski, the competing king of Poland in the war. The very same Duchy of Lorraine that Francis was the Duke of. The Austrian Minister of State asked Francis to give up his land, and three times he said no to the idea. The Austrian Minister then crudely said to Francis, quote, No abdication, no archduchess. Meaning, if you don't give up your duchy, your boo, Maria Theresa, she gone. The fourth time, he signed the paper of abdication. He would be compensated by becoming the Grand Duke of Tuscany. For this action, Francis married Maria Theresa on February 12, 1736, right across from the Hofburg Palace in the Church of the Augustinian Friars. This was a marriage where feelings of love were strong between the two partners, something extremely rare at the time. Maria Theresa ended up becoming pregnant within the first three months of the marriage. Her first kid was born on February 3, 1737. Maria Theresa gave birth to a daughter, which caused great anxiety in the Austrian court. Another development that caused anxiety was another war with the Ottoman Empire. Charles VI appointed his son-in-law, Francis, to command the Austrian troops in the fight against the Turks. Here's what Nancy Goldstone had to say about Francis's first military command. Quote, The new Grand Duke of Tuscany and his more experienced subordinate went off to Belgrade in the late spring of 1738. Soon after they arrived, they and the troops were involved in a skirmish with the enemy. To the collective joy of Vienna, but especially to Maria Theresa, who was pregnant again, the Imperial side won! 
I yelled so loud because she wrote it all in caps, so haha. Francis had won a small skirmish. He then followed up the victory by advancing quickly into the main Turkish army. Francis then led his troops into a retreat. Like brave Sir Robin, Francis bravely ran away to Austria to go hunting instead of doing this whole nasty war stuff. When danger reared its ugly head, Duke Francis turned his tail and fled. Luckily for Francis was that he was able to witness the birth of his child. However, the unlucky bit was that the baby was a girl. This caused the court of Vienna to be more worried about having a male heir. I mean, after all, how many more children could Maria Theresa have? On top of the anxiety of the question of male heir, there was bad news coming from the Balkans against the Turks that scared Vienna. There were even riots in the streets calling for Maria Theresa to be removed from the line of succession. On December 17, 1738, it was so bad that Emperor Charles VI asked Maria Theresa and her husband, Grand Duke Francis, to move to Tuscany for a short while to quiet things down in Vienna. While Maria Theresa and Francis were soaking up the beauty in Tuscany, Vienna was drowning in bad news. The war against the Turks was going badly, and the Austrians were panicking. They believed that another siege of Vienna, like the one in 1683, was about to occur. The British ambassador recorded, quote, Everything in Vienna is running into confusion and ruin. Emperor Charles was now in a deep depression. He signed a peace treaty with the Turks in September of 1739 that gave up Belgrade, Banat, and Wallachia to the Ottoman Empire. It didn't seem like it could get any worse for the Habsburg Empire now. I mean, what could be worse than an embarrassing defeat to the Turks? Ooh, I know, another daughter could be born, thus raising the question of whether Maria Theresa would ever give birth to a son. And that's what exactly happened in January of 1740. Then, on June 8, 1740, nine days after Frederick became king, Maria Theresa's three-year-old daughter died from a stomach infection in utter pain. Emperor Charles was in a fairly bad mood about all of this and chose to go hunting in Hungary later that fall. And let me tell you, the weather sucked real bad. The emperor was all like, eh, who cares about the weather? I want to kill some animals. So he eventually got a cold. So Charles would do what anyone would do, and he asked for a nice bowl of his favorite local dish, stewed mushrooms. Then, you know what happened? He came down with food poisoning. He then traveled back to Vienna and the doctors got to him immediately. The doctors knew that the mushrooms were fatal. Maria Theresa was not allowed to see her father one last time because she was pregnant and it was believed that she might catch an infection. However, Francis was able to see him and Charles said to him with his dying breaths, it is my greatest comfort to know that my daughter is in such good hands. With that, in the words of Edwin Stanton, Charles, quote, belongs to the ages. Charles VI was the Holy Roman Emperor for 29 years, and he was only 55 years old. I would like to finish today's episode by quoting Nancy Goldstone's brilliant book on Maria Theresa and her daughters. She writes, quote, Charles VI died on the morning of October 20th, 1740, surrounded by his family. He was 55 years old, and he had been emperor for nearly three decades. He left behind a ruined army, an empty treasury, a rebellious populace, a vastly reduced territory, and a series of paper promises from ambitious, land-hungry monarchs guaranteeing the right of accession to his 23-year-old, untrained, four months pregnant daughter, the first woman to ever inherit the empire. Voltaire ended up writing... Quote, a pot of mushrooms changed the history of Europe. And, to be completely honest, without that bowl of mushrooms, who knows if Germany as a unified state would exist. So, that was the Habsburg view of the events that would lead up to the War of Austrian succession. The pragmatic sanction allowed Maria Theresa to be the heir to the throne. Most countries resisted recognizing the pragmatic sanction until, 
by all means of diplomacy, the great powers recognized it. Maria Theresa had an almost fairy tale childhood compared to Frederick, with Maria Theresa actually being able to marry the man he, she loved. And a series of disasters that ended with Charles VI dying from a bowl of mushrooms. Truly, Maria Theresa had her work cut out for her. To conclude today's episode, I believe I will say to you that I hope you all have a wonderful week ahead.